Part of the problem is disease mongering, which I talk about often. Um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual grows every year, and they keep inventing new diseases. So right now, caffeine withdrawal is a psychiatric condition. Hoarding disorder, PMS. Uh, social communication disorder. Um, I think a lot of doctors suffer from that. that should, they should self-medicate. Um, cent <laughs> central... <laughs> Central sleep apnea, neurocognitive disorder, and restless leg syndrome. I'm wondering how you convert that into a psychiatric condition, but actually it's considered one. Now what this means is that there's about a 50% chance that when you visit a doctor's office, you can be medicated for some type of psychiatric condition. Now, part of the problem is that doctors in all medical specialties are now prescribing the drugs. In fact, um, there's a great book called Artificial Happiness by Ronald Dworkin that I highly recommend. And he talks about um, how people in the United States have been taught to think that everybody should be happy all the time. It's a right and privilege of living here. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I've not been happy for 63 years in a row. Sometimes bad things happen, right? Um, but there's a chapter in there about how um, doctors in family practice got kind of aggravated sending patients to specialists to make a lot more money than they did. And family practice docs did an all-out campaign to maintain control over the prescribing of antidepressants to their patients. And so um, what happens is, you know, the shorter and shorter visit is the order of the day. So people go into a doctor's office and... Um, and the doctor says, how are you doing? Well, think about malnourished, overweight, sedentary, dehydrated people going into a doctor's office. They usually don't say, I feel marvelous, right? So they say things like, I don't know, I'm kind of tired, I sleep a lot. Um, you know, in the wintertime, I feel a little bit blue, I don't go anywhere. And this sounds remarkably like depression. And this often results in a diagnosis and a, an antidepressant is prescribed. And in fact, Dworkin, uh, in his book, mentions a study in which people were sent into a GP's office and basically told to say, uh, in response to how are you, I'm having a tough time. I've lost my job, finances are tight, and I'm getting divorced. And half the time, without any further discussion, people were given a drug. Um, pretty scary. So right now, every time somebody has a negative thought or emotion or behavior, it's now considered pathology that requires treatment. And the standard care, standard of care treatment is drugs. And this ignores the fact that there's a relationship between diet and lifestyle habits and mental and psychological health. The problem is the drugs are easy to prescribe and not very easy to deprescribe. So um, there we go. Um, drug withdrawal is very difficult, and the reason is that there's nothing the matter with your brain when you start taking these drugs, but they do alter your brain when you take them for a while. And withdrawal often um, means that people have extremely distressing symptoms, sometimes dangerous. Uh, the brain can be very slow to recover, and um, the compensatory effects don't go away very quickly. Judgment and self-control can be quite impaired. Severe depression, mania, psychosis, violence, and suicide can be a result. And the original problems that led the person to take the drug in the first place uh, resurface and sometimes resurface considerably uh, stronger than at, um, before they were drugged. Um, it's interesting, uh, prescribers know, uh, often don't know how dangerous the drugs are and um, they don't understand why the patient would want to withdraw. And the biggest reason why I've experienced people wanting to withdraw is because the drugs don't make them happy, they make them numb. And there, there's a difference between blunting negative emotions and living a spectacular life. Nobody ever lives a spectacular life by blunting the emotions that they're having that are unpleasant. And, and one thing that I tell people all the time is to watch that movie, Oh God. How many of you people saw it? Anybody see that with George Burns? And one of the most poignant moments in the film is when the little girl asks George Burns, playing God, you know, why, if you're God, do bad things happen? And he says to her, his answer is, you know, it's interesting. I didn't know what else to do because I couldn't create an up without a down and a front without a back and a high without a low. And so when you are drugged, you don't feel the strong negative emotions, but you don't feel the strong, great emotions either. And after a while being in a fog, some people say, you know what, I don't think that I should have signed up for this, and that's why they want to get off the drugs. It's hard to find somebody to assist, and what happens is that often people will go back to their prescriber 
sometimes psychiatrists who are not very friendly, who will say, well, you know, if you think you want to try life without drugs, then just go on ahead and stop taking them. Well, I don't know if you know anybody who's done that, but it's usually fairly disastrous. Sometimes people end up hospitalized, they have a psychotic break, and then the psychiatrist says, well, see, you needed to stay on those drugs the whole time. And um, so what we tell people to do is this has to be, it's like building a house, you need a blueprint, right? Nobody just starts stacking wood and bricks and that sort of thing when they're building a house. So if you're gonna do this and do this successfully, uh, then you need to have a plan, you need a team, and you need a prescriber to work with you, and you need to have a very gradual approach to doing this. And in addition to that, you've got to start building a strong, healthy body to help you withstand the difficulty associated with the physical symptoms of withdrawal from the drugs. Thank you.